April 1945, the sea north of Okinawa is etched with radar picket stations, thin strands of steel, and men strung far from the main fleet. On the scopes, the blips multiply and merge. Ashore, the island is a battlefield of mud and flame. Above it all, a new reality of naval air defense has settled in. A geometry of interception where fighter pilots, the kamikaze hunters of the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps, streak toward incoming raiders while their own fleet throws walls of steel into the sky. And in that sky, an invisible trigger waits within five-inch shells. The proximity, or VT, fuse. It will detonate not at a preset time, not on impact, but when it senses an aircraft close enough for a lethal burst. The pilots hunting the attackers have learned to trust the fleet's gunners. They will also learn to fear the unseen reach of the new fuse exploding in their flight paths. The VT fuse was the product of urgent wartime innovation, born of a simple need and an extraordinarily complex solution. Conventional anti-aircraft fire relied on guesswork refined by mathematics, the setting of mechanical time fuse based on predicted paths of fast-moving targets. A shell that passed a fraction of a second early or late could be harmless. The proximity fuse changed that calculus. Inside the fuse body lay tiny vacuum tubes and a miniature radio transmitter receiver. As the shell flew, it radiated and listened. When an aircraft's skin or propeller disrupted the returning signal in the right way, the circuit fired the detonator. A near miss became a lethal near burst. The device was called VT for variable time to hide its true nature in terse communications and paperwork. The Navy adopted it first, knowing that air bursts over the ocean would deny the enemy any chance of recovering and copying a dud. Early in 1943, in the waters around the Solomons, U.S. warships began to use the fuse in combat. Performance reports filtered up the chain in careful language. The proportion of aircraft damaged and destroyed by five-inch airbursts climbed sharply. It was not only that more shells detonated near their targets, it was that those detonations occurred at the worst possible moment for the attacker, within a cloud of fragmenting steel perfectly placed by the aim of directors in the sensing of the fuse. As the war shifted west and the Imperial Japanese Navy turned increasingly to suicide tactics, the VT fuse found its grim proving ground. The organized use of special attack units began in the Leyte campaign in October 1944 and intensified through the winter. At Okinawa, the culmination of Japan's air effort against the fleet unfolded in massed raids, the Kikasui attacks, that hurled hundreds of aircraft toward the American ships. The U.S. answer was a layered defense. Radar pickets to see far, fighter direction officers to vector combat air patrols, and every gun from 20 millimeter to 5 inch to make the sky murderous. In this defense, proximity fuse 5 inch ammunition became the long arm of the fleet's protectors. Guided by radar directors and fire control computers, the guns could throw patterns of air bursts into the projected path of an incoming aircraft at ranges where 40 millimeter and 20 millimeter weapons were still out of reach. When it worked as designed, the effect was startling. Kamikaze aircraft flying low over the water to evade detection and dilute the effectiveness of heavy guns would suddenly be bracketed by bursts, their wings and engines hammered by fragments, even though no shell had struck them squarely. Many wavered or splashed short. Others arrived at the screen already crippled, to be finished by closer range fire. For the fighter pilots, the calculus of risk changed almost overnight. Trained to pounce on contacts as far from the task force as possible, they were driven by instinct and doctrine to close, to intercept, to pursue. They were the hunters, but the sky around the fleet had become an instrumented volume, mapped by radar bearings and altitudes, animated by predictions of where the enemy would be seconds from now. The five-inch batteries were no longer throwing timed bursts into a general zone. They were putting proximity-triggered steel into exactly the space through which a fighter on a pursuit curve might have to fly. In after-action reports from the Okinawa campaign, pilots expressed a new kind of frustration. The Japanese flak over their airfields had always been dangerous, but its patterns were familiar. The American air bursts around the fleet were uncomfortably precise and disconcertingly indifferent to friend and foe. The proximity fuse could not tell the difference. 
a Hellcat or Corsair that crossed into an engagement basket aimed at a kamikaze would find itself sharing the same space with bursts tuned to explode in the presence of metal. Even at what felt like a safe offset, detonations could occur close enough to pepper a wing with fragments or crack a canopy. Several fighters were lost or damaged in this way, not always recorded as friendly fire, often folded into the chaos of a raid where multiple defenses were firing in desperation. The Navy adapted. Fighter direction officers, perched in radar picket destroyers and carriers' combat information centers, began carving exclusion volumes into the air above their screens. They assigned specific altitudes to combat air patrols and warned batteries to hold their VT fire when fighters were engaged in certain sectors. Procedural codes and brevity calls evolved to signal an immediate check fire when intercepts merged with gun target lines. Gunners trained to respond to order and tempo learned to ride the hairline between keeping steel in the air and avoiding a catastrophe. Some ships segmented their arcs of fire to preserve lanes for fighters to chase incoming aircraft. Others imposed altitude floors for proximity-fused bursts, relying on mechanical time or contact-fused weapons when friendlies were entangled with the enemy. The tension between air and surface defense was a measure of proximity fuses' effectiveness. The fragments that tore through aluminum and magnesium also tore through the truss that had once allowed fighter and flak to coexist with fewer restrictions. Yet few questioned the overall effect. Statistical analysis conducted during and after the war credited proximity fuses with multiplying the effectiveness of 5-inch anti-aircraft fire several times over. Ships that would have been forced to rely on last-ditch weapons now had a chance to disrupt, divert, or destroy attackers before they reached terminal dive. The Japanese, for their part, paid in blood to learn what this meant. Kamikaze pilots, often trained only enough to take off, navigate, and dive, were briefed on evasion. Approach low, use the sun, weave unpredictably, but found themselves caught in patterns of bursting steel that seemed almost sentient. Their courage did not diminish the physics. A VT-triggered five-inch shell detonating at the right range throws thousands of fragments forward and outward. The density and velocity of that swarm is unforgiving. Many never reached the point where their resolve could convert any impact. The secrecy surrounding the fuse persisted to the end. Crews were instructed to prevent capture at all costs. Duds were to be scuttled or destroyed. Pilots knew enough to complain and to ask for tighter coordination. They did not always know why shells behaved as they did. In time, debriefings institutionalized the lessons. Cap stations were pushed further out, Interception was emphasized beyond the envelope of heavy gun coverage. In some raids, the most effective pattern was an early, fighter-driven cull of attackers, then a controlled yield to the five-inch batteries once the fight collapsed into the outer screen. The interplay was never perfect. Radar picket ships, magnets for everything the Japanese could fly, often had to fire, regardless of the fighter's proximity. Their casualty lists, destroyers and smaller escorts battered and sunk, are the melancholy ledger of that necessity. By war's end, proximity fuses had become a symbol of quiet, decisive technological advantage. In Europe, they would help cut down V-1 flying bombs and savage German troop concentrations in the Ardennes. In the Pacific, they helped blunt an unprecedented form of aerial attack. For the men aloft, however, the memory carried a particular sharpness. They had flown through friendly airbursts, seen shock waves wrinkle fuel and wings, and returned to decks with shrapnel embedded in control surfaces. Some learned the hard edges of the new doctrine, some did not return. The lessons they forced into procedures, altitude separation, sector discipline, positive control, echoed in post-war air defense concepts, from carrier picket lines to missile era, no fire zones. The phrase the pilots would have used for themselves was simple. They were hunters. They had gone up day after day to meet aircraft bent on dying to kill them in their ships. What they never expected, not at first, was that the most dangerous bursts in their flight paths might be set off by their own side's shells, detonated by a fuse that could not distinguish a friend's pursuit curve from an enemy's dive until doctrine taught the fleet to make that distinction for it. In the long accounting of Okinawa's defense, the proximity fuse stands as both savior and stern teacher. It made the sky deadlier for attackers and, for a time, more perilous for the defenders who flew through it to hunt them.